Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour et bienvenue. Mon nom est Corita Pierre de l'équipe marketing événementiel et je serai votre animatrice pour cet événement SAQ Inspire, ces femmes qui font briller le vin. Je suis extrêmement fière d'animer cette, anima- cette dégustation 100% féminine, mettant en valeur le travail des femmes au quotidien et plus spécifiquement dans le monde vinicole. Sans plus tarder, voici quelques détails à retenir. Premièrement, à chaque service de dégustation, je vais vous nommer le vin à déguster. Alors, vous allez avoir le temps de vous servir un verre de vin. De plus, tous les produits proposés lors de cette dégustation sont en vente à l'unité dans SAQ.com. Vous allez trouver toutes les informations à ce sujet dans le carnet virtuel disponible dans la description de cette vidéo. Aussi, si vous appréciez cette dégustation, merci de cliquer sur le bouton « J'aime » et de vous abonner à notre chaîne YouTube pour avoir accès à plus de contenu. N'hésitez pas à partager votre expérience sur vos réseaux sociaux en utilisant nos euh, hashtags SAQ. L'événement se déroulera en français et en anglais et YouTube offre l'option de traduction simultanée en cliquant le bouton de sous-titrage en bas de votre écran. Alors, les femmes ont toujours occupé une place importante dans le vignoble, mais n'ont pas toujours bénéficié de la visibilité associée à leur rôle. Elles ont longtemps été reléguées à un rôle anonyme, travaillant dans l'ombre et le con, euh, alors, envers leurs confrères masculins. Aujourd'hui, nous souhaitons souligner leur travail et leur apport important et leur grande passion avec le vin. Sans plus tarder, je veux vous présenter quelques-unes de ces femmes exceptionnelles. Tout d'abord, on est chez nous au Québec avec Madame Anne-Marie Lemire du vignoble Léon Courville. Bonjour, Bonjour Madame Lemire. Bonjour. Ça va bien? Très bien, merci. Euh, en second lieu, on s'en va un peu en Italie euh, avec Elena Curado. Ciao, Elena. Hi, hello. Hello. Et on s'en va chez nos voisins en Californie avec Madame Putnam du, Raymond, du vignoble Raymond Vineyard. Hello, Madame Putnam. Bonjour. Bonjour. Merci d'avoir accepté notre invitation. Mais commençons maintenant avec notre première invitée, Madame Lemire, qui a touché à l'univers vinicole, qui est maintenant la directrice générale du vignoble Léon Courville. Madame Lemire, merci d'être ici avec nous. Et maintenant, je veux vous dire merci pour nous amener chez vous, dans votre boutique, directement du domaine. Mais oui, bienvenue. Bienvenue au lac Brom. <rire> On aime ça, la technologie de nos jours. Oui. Mais ben, là, euh, oui, allez-y. Effectivement, c'est la technologie, mais comme vous voyez, on est dans un vieux bâtiment. Alors, ouais. c'était à l'époque notre érablière qu'on a transformée ah. en chien. Alors, ça, ça donne un petit look rustique, mais moderne à la fois. On aime ça. Oui, merci. Vraiment. Merci. Et là, parlez-nous un peu de votre histoire professionnelle. Ben moi, moi, tout d'abord, je n'ai pas du tout un euh, background dans le vin. Là. Moi, je suis mm-hmm. née d'une famille à Montréal. Ma mère euh, était à l'origine, elle cultivait les tomates maraîchères, là, tu, tu vois, le, le, un peu. Et puis, mon père, lui, était d'une famille d'entrepreneurs. On peut dire que ma mère, elle, elle faisait pousser les fruits et les légumes et mon père appréciait comment on les transformait. Okay. Ce qui était très intéressant et complémentaire. Et c'est mon père qui nous a beaucoup habitués à bien manger et bien boire, surtout. On était tout petits et il nous montrait comment servir le vin. Mais honnêtement, je n'aurais jamais pensé que je travaillerais dans ce milieu-là de la façon dont je le fais actuellement. Okay. Parce que moi, je n'ai pas du tout étudié dans ce, dans ce domaine-là. En fait, c'est euh, il y a à peu près euh, 20 ans, euh, j'ai, euh, c'est mon, mon conjoint qui a parti ce projet-là parce que lui avait pris sa retraite assez tôt et euh, il s'était dit « Ah, ben euh, j'aimerais pouvoir utiliser mes talents d'entrepreneur dans un, un, un champ complètement différent d'action que ce qu'il avait fait avant. Mm-hmm. » Alors, euh, suite à une visite qu'il avait faite en Ontario, il a planté quelques vignes à côté de la maison et puis euh, on n'a pas eu trop de succès cette cette fois-là, parce qu'il faut dire qu'il y a 20 ans, on n'avait pas les mêmes techniques. Hein. Tu sais, au oui. Québec, euh, on n'était pas... Euh, on ne savait pas comment couvrir les vignes. Mm-hmm. Euh, c'était compliqué pour nous euh, de vraiment protéger de l'hiver, des gels printaniers. Alors, euh, on avait planté du, euh, un cépage qui n'a pas survécu. C'était Et quoi le cépage a... à l'époque? C'était euh, du Cabernet Franc. OK. Euh, maintenant, ça survivrait, mais à l'époque, oui. euh, pas du tout. Alors, euh, on s'est entêté 
Euh, et on a continué euh, en, en plantant des cépages hybrides oui. et en calquant beaucoup ce que l'Ontario avait fait. Parce que ça, ça nous permettait d'avoir des guides aussi. Euh, on s'est lié d'amitié avec des gens là-bas qui nous ont euh, beaucoup aidés. Okay. Et plus le vignoble évoluait, plus les techniques évoluaient. Alors maintenant, on a 11 cépages différents, et dont des cépages qu'on dit euh, nobles, euh, des vinifera. On a du chardonnay, mmh. du pinot mmh. et du, euh, du riesling. Et tout le reste, c'est des cépages hybrides. Oui, exactement. Okay. Nous, ce qui nous intéresse beaucoup, euh, c'est de travailler avec les cépages hybrides pour en sortir euh, le meilleur. Alors, même après 20 ans, on est en train encore d'expérimenter, on est encore en train de découvrir qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour vraiment euh, euh, faire les vins le mieux possible dans le climat, dans les conditions, puis avec les raisins qu'on a. Mais simplement pour expliquer, euh, pour expliquer aux gens à la maison, euh, les cépages hybrides pour euh, la température ici au Québec, pourquoi qu'on utilise les cépages hybrides? Bien, il y a deux raisons. Il y a, il y a beaucoup d'hybrides dans le monde. Nous, on utilise beaucoup d'hybrides français mm -hmm. euh, parce qu'ils sont résistants à la maladie. Mais il y a d'autres cépages qu'on dit plus rustiques, comme le Saint-Pépin, dont, dont on va parler tantôt, qui, lui, a une immense euh, tolérance au froid. Il va tolérer jusqu'à moins 32 degrés Celsius. Les cépages hybrides. C'est euh, Non, ce, celui-là, rustique. Un, rustique. un hybride rustique. C'est quand même un, un hybride de, de deux autres cépages hybrides. Euh, alors, mais quand même, c'est euh, Ce n'est pas, euh, pas tous les hybrides qui sont rustiques, qui peuvent toujours tolérer okay. les grandes températures, euh, le, le froid qu'on connaît finalement. Mm -hmm. Alors, euh, on travaille avec ça et là maintenant, on a maintenant 14 hectares, je crois, de ah. vignes plantées et on fait euh, à peu près 16 vins différents. Okay. Alors, on utilise les cépages à différentes, euh, différentes fonctions. Au départ, on pensait faire beaucoup d'assemblage. Puis là, plus on, a découvert, plus on a découvert les cépages, plus on a découvert les goûts, moins on fait, des, on fait plutôt des monocépages maintenant. OK. Alors, euh, on produit euh, plus de 100 000 bouteilles par année. Quand même? Oui, 110 000 par année. Ouais. Et pour vous, c'était quand le point tournant des vins québécois? Et vous avez dit, OK, c'est là, là qu'on est rendu des vins étoilé, là, qu'on se dit, OK, c'est vraiment que c'est, on a trouvé notre style. Euh, en quelle année? Surtout pour nous, comme oui. vignoble, je dirais que quand on a eu la grande appréciation de Jancis Robinson, wow. qui, a beaucoup, qui nous a beaucoup aidé, elle nous a donné une critique dans le Financial Times de, de, de Londres sur le réserve Vidal, là, on s'est dit, ah, OK, euh, il y a vraiment... Euh, on est apprécié, on fait, les, on fait bien les choses et puis on a continué dans cette veine-là. Nous, on, on fait des vins avec des méthodes plus traditionnelles, même si maintenant on fait des vins euh, avec beaucoup moins d'interventions qu'on pouvait le faire par le passé, euh, mais on suit beaucoup plus les vins européens comme vins. Alors, l'appréciation de Genesis Robinson, c'est là que ça nous a... Ça, c'était en 2000... Un vin de 2008, donc elle a le dégusté en 2010-2011. Alors, on était... Là, on s'est dit, OK, euh, wow! On se lance. Et c'est d'ailleurs à peu près à ce moment-là où on a beaucoup planté. Alors on, a, on a beaucoup agrandi le vignoble, on a acheté des terres à côté de chez nous et tout. Il faut dire aussi que le lieu chez nous est absolument magnifique. On est oui. devant le lac, c'est beau, sur des coteaux, on est, il y a du sable un peu. C'est très, très bon comme terroir. Et puis, okay. en plus, la, la vue est magnifique. Donc, c'est pas difficile d'être passionné de culture et de vin chez nous. Là. Vraiment et on peut venir vous visiter euh... Oui. Oui, oui, N'importe quand. Oui, oui, on est ouvert. Là, on est fermé parce que le mois de janvier, on, on en profite pour faire euh, tous nos rapports et okay. les inventaires oui. et tout. Mais après ça, on rouvre tous les week-ends, toute l'année. Ouais. OK, c'est génial. Wow! Ouais. C'est quand le meilleur moment pour, euh, pour venir? Mais ça dépend. Oui. Si on veut voir les vendanges, c'est euh, beaucoup plus en septembre. En Mais euh, si vous voulez avoir plus de temps puis euh, jaser avec nous, je oui. suis toujours là. Ça serait plus juillet. OK. Où, je dirais. Euh, mais si on, a, on est libre, euh, mai-juin, euh, c'est vraiment là où je peux me promener et euh, vraiment parler beaucoup, beaucoup avec les clients. Les clients. D'ailleurs, le commentaire des clients et les feedbacks des clients, c'est vraiment très important pour nous. Ça nous oui. fait beaucoup euh, évoluer. Est-ce qu'on est, qu est obligé de réserver ou on peut venir? Ça dépend euh... ce qu'on veut faire, mais okay. en mai-juin, non, je suis là puis, puis l'équipe est là puis euh, ça va nous faire oh, plaisir de parler à tout le monde. Ouais. Alors, bon, mais, mesdames et messieurs, on va commencer par notre première dégustation, le, le Saint-Pépin 2019. Alors, euh, on y va. Bien, un mot sur le Saint-Pépin oui. avant. Le Saint-Pépin, c'est un cépage très particulier parce que c'est rustique, mais ça n'a que des fleurs femelles. 
D'accord. Donc, il faut toujours le planter à côté d'un autre euh, cépage. Nous, on le plante à côté du céval. Alors, ça amène des difficultés. Mais comme il tolère moins 32, on n'a pas besoin de le, de le couvrir. Donc, il y a des pour et des contre, mais c'est un cépage un peu plus euh, audacieux à, à cultiver. Okay. Alors, on voit ici la belle robe euh, vraiment sur le, le or. Ce qu'on déguste, c'est un 2019. Mm -hmm. Donc, le, millé le millésime 2019 était… Euh, l'été avait été euh, bien, l'automne plus difficile. Donc, on a un peu plus de vivacité euh, dans le vin. Si euh, hmm, c'est un vin qui a fait euh, 80, à peu près 9 mois de barrique, 50 barrique française, 50 barrique américaine, dont 15 neuve à peu près. Donc, il est marqué dans le bois, mais après trois ans, ça s'est vraiment bien harmonisé avec les autres arômes. On a du miel, la vanille, euh, du, de la fleur, beaucoup de jasmin. Belle touche florale, oui. Oui. Et euh, c'est vraiment un, un vin qui, euh, tout en élégance, mais aussi avec beaucoup de matière. Donc, c'est un, un vin qu'on peut mâcher, bien équilibré. Oui. Alors, en bouche. On sent tout le gras. En bouche, on sent les arômes. C'est un vin qui, première gorgée, on dit, oh, c'est intéressant. Oui. Deuxième gorgée, c'est comme, wow, ça nous amène ailleurs. C'est vraiment un vin qui a une très bonne longueur en bouche. Tellement bien équilibré. Qui, qui, a, qui occupe toute structure. la bouche. Exactement, c'est ça. Et puis, euh, c'est euh, autant du floral que le fruit, euh, un petit peu de pomme verte, euh, mais euh, à la fin, c'est le miel qui reste. Et puis, c'est ça qui nous attire vers une autre gorgée. Alors, on... Une belle acidité, mais tout en douceur. Oui. C'est vraiment un vin élégant. Moi, si j'ai un mot à dire, c'est l'élégance. L'élégance, ce ouais. tout à fait. Et puis, euh, évidemment, nous, les Québécois, on est des forts adeptes de produits de la mer, hein, le homard, oui. le crabe. Oh. Puis ça, c'est vraiment le vin pour aller euh, avec les fruits de mer. Vraiment. Le parfait accord. Ah, ben, carrément. Soit en risotto ou même juste comme ça, avec oui. un vin, avec une, une petite sauce au beurre. C'est magnifique. Puis même en apéro. Oh, ben oui, oui. Ça se boit n'importe quand. Oh. Mais il, il faut le boire <rire> doucement. Il faut y penser. Il oui. faut vraiment prendre la peine d'y goûter. C'est un vin euh, méditatif, quasiment. Ouais. Oh, c'est bien dit. <rire> oui, oh, J'adore, Mais c'est vraiment une fierté parce que de plus en plus, les vins de chez nous, là, c est, c est, je, je le dis tout le temps quand on me pose la question, euh, oh, parce que j'ai... Euh, oui, j'adore le vin, bien sûr. Et j'ai beaucoup d'amis, oh, Corita, qu'est-ce que tu penses des vins de chez nous et tout ça? Mais honnêtement, je le dis tout le temps, mais là, est, on est rendu là. À l'époque, je disais tout le temps, il faut donner du temps au temps, puis il faut donner du temps à nos vins de chez nous. Mais maintenant, je crois qu'on est rendu là. Oui. Le temps est arrivé et les vins, on l'a. Oui, oui, vraiment... on peut être très fiers de ce qui, ce qui est fait fière. au Québec. Euh, mais Tout à fait. Dans, avec euh, toute l'ingéniosité qu'on a. Tu sais, les Québécois, on est des gens ingénieux, hein? on est des patenteux. Alors, on s'est organisé. C'est bien dit. Oui, on s'est organisé avec ce qu'on a, ce qu'on a réalisé. Euh, c'est bien dit, c'est vraiment des patenteux. Ouais. C'est vraiment de chez nous. <rire> c'est ça. Merci. Merci. Alors, j'ai une première question pour euh, vous, mesdames. I have a question for all of you ladies right now. Euh, tout d'abord, euh, quelle est votre approche et vision euh, lorsque vous travaillez le vin et aussi dans le, le côté euh, des affaires dans le milieu du vin? What is your approach and vision when you're working uh, the wine and also business-wise when you're working in the wine world? Alors, euh, Madame Lemire. Bien, moi, je dirais que mon approche, c'est, premièrement, on ne travaille pas le vin tout seul. Hein. Il faut travailler avec une équipe parce que ce n'est pas vrai qu'on a le goût ultime là, puis que le, le goût de tout le monde. Alors, j'aime travailler en équipe, mais j'aime aussi beaucoup démocratiser le, le vin. Euh, Puisqu'on ne vient pas d'une grande tradition euh, au Québec dans le vin, on peut se permettre d'avoir une approche vraiment décontractée, euh, vraiment plus... Euh, euh, plus ouverte euh, parce que euh, on n'a pas euh, nécessairement euh, des, des façons de faire qui sont bien, bien ancrées chez nous. Donc, c'est l'ouverture, c'est la participation et puis c'est surtout beaucoup, beaucoup de passion. Merci. Bien tout bien. à fait. Et, um, Elena, what is your vision working wines and business-wise when you're uh, approaching this universe? Ben, uh, uh, it's, it's a mix of everything, of mm -hmm. course. It's a mix of a lot of things. Uh, 
uh, I haven't talked yet, but uh, I'm personally not uh, involved completely in the production, so I'm more in the commercial aspect of the winery, even mm -hmm. if I do all the technical uh, tasting with uh, my husband, uh, because I think the feminine touch is uh, really something very special in uh, into the wine. So for me, uh, wine is... Um, is a way to build up, uh, uh, of course, uh, connection and uh, to to have an instrument that can connect uh, really different kind of people from any any different kind uh, of uh, field mm -hmm. uh, around the table with a glass of wine uh, and uh, a bottle of wine. Uh, who cares who are you? But uh, really. Uh, everybody comes together and uh, mm -hmm. is really something uh, always uh, very special. It's, uh, special. it's really something that connect uh, the connection that create the wine and food, of course, because yeah. it's not only wine, but uh, uh, we always see wine and food together is something uh, very unique uh, uh, and very special. And I think that uh, more and more uh, also for the younger generation, uh, uh, I see that uh, is the field in which uh, most of the younger guys that uh, they want to be in. So that that's very nice. It's true, and it removes the boundaries. Yes. When we sit of course, yeah. Down when you are when you are when you are I see during the tasting we have at the cellar can be any different uh, you know society level mm -hmm. level, but around the table with a glass of wine and eventually some food. Uh, really you know boundaries uh, are forgotten <laughs> yeah it's true it's very true thank you thank you yeah, very much very welcome and for you mrs uh, putnam what is your vision when you're approaching this world or business wise or when you're working with wine what is your vision when you're approaching this industry in terms of my vision or how i approach wines i like to make wines that are very elegant yes. but sexy yes I'm much like this room, I have to represent this room. <laughs> um, we also need to have a lot of finesse. And when I'm making a Napa Valley Cabernet, people expect it to be bigger and bolder, have a lot of fruit, have a lot of tannins. But the most important thing for me in the wine is the balance. Is mm -hmm. it seamless from start to finish? That is what makes a great wine. Because it can be a very round, light, soft wine, very elegant. But if it's not balanced, you're going to notice that maybe the tannins are drying or maybe there's a hole in the middle palate. So achieving mm -hmm. balance where the wine is seamless from start to finish, that's the most important thing for me in terms of the overall wine style. Mm -hmm. um, Business-wise, it's an interesting question because everyone always thinks, romanticizes the wine industry. Like, I, you know, I got That's up this so morning true. and oh. and I made this wine and then magically it was sold. And there is a lot of hard work and a lot of financial decisions that go on behind the scenes because, mm -hmm. you know, the, wor the world doesn't exist around me just making this wine. Someone's got to sell it. Someone's got to, to buy it. So business-wise, each wine that we do needs to stand on its own. So how I treat our Napa Valley Reserve might be a little bit different than I would treat our Generations, which is our um, higher end wine at Raymond that represents the five generations of family winemaking. So I might use different grapes. I might use different techniques. I might use more oak or less oak, a little bit, uh, maybe some stainless steel aging or 100% aging in barrels. So. I try and style my winemaking technique and the grape sourcing to what the ultimate price point is of the wine bottle. Because again, every wine has to stand on itself. Got it. So that takes out a little bit of the, the romantic vision that everyone has. Yes. But at the end of the day, um, if the wines don't stand on their own, both in terms of quality and uh, finances, then I won't be here tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. So in other words, you treat every single product that you have regarding their own personality, because like you say, they stand on their own. They need to stand on their own. Yeah. And I understand what each, like, I understand, well, I hope I understand 
what people are expecting with our Napa okay. Valley Reserve Cabernet, which might be different than another wine. So each wine is treated differently. I got it. Yeah, totally. Because I well, that's my opinion, because I think that we don't see that enough, the back end of that side of wines. And that's great that every single of you women have shared that part of the industry, which is very interesting to share with everybody that's here today to see that it's true that it's not only the dream and then you put it in the, the bottle and we just sell it and it sells on its own. You really have to put there's the a work lot of work. Back. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work. Hard business. <laughs> it's a hard business. It is. And yeah, it's, business. Business. it's beautiful. Yeah. C'est, c'est un très beau travail, mais c'est beaucoup, beaucoup de temps pour, uh, pour arriver dans la coupe. It's a lot of, lot of work to arrive in your cup, that I was saying in, in French. Alors, um, à, à l'époque, l'univers uh, viticole était plus traditionnellement réservé aux hommes. Et euh, aujourd'hui, il y a des avantages qui est beaucoup plus euh, familier à avoir des femmes dans des rôles clés dans, le, dans ce domaine. Et ma question est pour, euh, pour les femmes ici aujourd'hui, quel est votre plus grand apport en, dans l'industrie? So my next question for, for all of you women, uh, like I was saying back in the days, uh, the industry was really male oriented. And now I was asking is what is your uh, advantage <coughs> and your contribution as a woman in your key roles? Because this is what I, what I find interesting with us. Well, you three, you have different roles in this industry. What is your um, biggest contribution in this industry? Madame Le Mire. Ben, moi, je dirais que en général, sans tomber dans les stéréotypes, mais mm-hmm. les femmes qui travaillent avec moi sont beaucoup plus débrouillardes. Ils vont trouver des solutions, Ils sont habitués au, excusez l'anglicisme, mais au multitasking. Et puis, euh, ils sont euh, d'emblée collaboratrices. Et je pense que dans le monde actuel, c'est vraiment important de faire participer tout le monde. On gagne à avoir des idées différentes. On gagne à avoir des goûteurs différents. On gagne à avoir des, euh, des clients de différents pays et tout. Alors, il faut euh, tout mettre ça ensemble. Puis je pense que c'est une grande qualité féminine, ça, en général. C'est vraiment intéressant. C'est vraiment intéressant. Um, for you, Alana, what is your... Uh... I, I have a nice history because when I was younger, mm-hmm. my idea when I had to decide the high school was to attend to an logical school. But uh, my mother was absolutely saying no because an uh, logical school was uh, basically mainly for uh, men, for yes. boys. Uh-huh. And so she didn't want absolutely. I had this uh, dream to, to do the logical school, to attend the logical school, and I couldn't. Uh, so I had to do la- to choose uh, languages, <laughs> and I did uh, my high school uh, in uh, languages field. Uh, and my passion has been always the wine. And I met my husband very young, so I went into into the wine in a different way. So when I met Luca, uh, my husband, that uh, I was eighteen, almost yes. nineteen, yes. and so I we grew up together, and I grew up in the wine world, uh, entering in a different way. Uh, so I can confirm that I really was, uh, you know, still thirty uh, uh, years ago, thirty five years ago, still very male. Uh, this world, but thanks God today, and I can confirm because we have a lot of uh, producers in Piemonte, I speak for, for the region where I come from, uh, which uh, have uh, producers that have girls. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and most of them, they are now at the Neological School, or most of them, they are now running wineries. And so thanks God this uh, Uh, it's still very difficult, eh? it's still very male, but uh, little by little we try to give our contribution, working uh, always very hard, being, uh, and I agree, uh, multitasking. Uh, also, at the we have a lot of uh, women working with us, and okay. we think that this uh, is a really very, you know, uh, added value, uh, the sensibility and the approach uh, uh, to many different problems, uh, daily problems uh, is different, not to be, you know, uh, stereotyped. Uh, uh, but it's, it's stereotype, but uh, uh, for me it's, uh, it's like this. So I try myself uh, to be, uh, to con- uh, 
around promoting and uh, putting my face uh, really to to make people understand and the world understand that, that uh, women can do really well in this uh, world in this oh. uh, field yes in the wine and you're, world you're the living proof that you cannot run away from your passion no, you're saying I that you really always away. wanted I'm, to work I'm in there. the wine industry <laughs> yeah. at 18 years old, and you're yeah. still in that industry. I'm still there. I'm still <laughs> there, and I think I will be involved, I hope, for a very long time. But this is a, it's a passion that when you have passion, uh, maybe also my background was not uh, in a logical school, uh, but when you have passion, uh, I think you, you can't run you away. Can you, you can run away, and you can do whatever you it want. It will always follow you. Yeah. <laughs> and at least you followed it and you're still there. So that's that's amazing. Uh, yeah. That's thanks. great for you. And for you, Mrs. Putnam. Uh, how do I feel that I contribute? It's an interesting yes. question because when I started out in the wine industry, it was I when I went to I went to UC Davis, got my degree. And at the school, so I would which, say which um, domain your degree. Sorry. Uh, in, in enology. Okay. And there was, I, I think the entire department was maybe 20% women. Okay. So okay. I, I think it's, it's, there is, unfortunately, women are held to a different standard than our male counterparts, mm -hmm. because I think we have to be talented, we have to be skilled. And if we're sharp in business sense, you have to be careful that if you're not, if you're you can be firm, but not hard, because that's viewed differently as a man than it is a female. Yes. Um, when I started out in the business, I actually worked in the cellar, and the guys played some very dirty tricks on me. Not at the winery, but at the winery. So I had to prove myself, and I've always been very thankful to my first boss, because someone, someone has to believe in you, and someone has to give you that chance. And to have my first boss believe in me and say, okay, yes, I think you can do this. Um, he hired me because I used to do a lot of rock climbing. And he thought okay. that I would be strong enough to work with the guys in the cellar. That was the only reason he hired me was I had my rock climbing experience. Really? But to have that boss believe in you and kind of mentor you has been an experience that I have taken with God. Because I feel that just like I got my first chance, I need to pass that on to another person. So because every everyone needs to have that one moment or that one person that believes in them, and it's up to you to make that make make what you want of that opportunity. But someone has to open the door. You have to decide to walk through that door and own that opportunity. But you need that person to believe in you. So I've really tried hard to find certain people and mentor them, be them men or women, and give them that opportunity and mm -hmm. give them that belief that someone gave to me. Because you just need that one person that says, I think you can do it. And that's all you need to really kind of own what the possibilities are. That's very well said. And it's very humbling to hear that. J'aime bien que tout le monde n'a pas, comme que vous avez bien dit, on n'a pas tombé dans le, 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 le stéréotype, mais mm -hmm. c'est vraiment direct et ça, ça fait du sens. C'est vraiment, euh, j'apprécie vraiment beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Putnam. It makes great sense and I, I appreciate to hear that from different perspectives and on, we're in different parts of the countries and the, and the world as well. Alors, euh, il est maintenant euh, temps de, de voyager en Italie, plus spécifiquement euh, dans, dans la région de Piémont avec euh, Elena. Et on est avec le vignoble Vietti. Yes. So, uh, Elena, we are honored yes. to be with you today. And can you please give us, because you gave us a little bit about your background and uh, your passion since the age of 18. So can yeah. you give us more on uh, your full story of your uh, background in the wine industry and then after tell us more about the history of the family vineyard. 
Sure. No, but I already say that my passion goes back a uh, long time ago. Yes. <laughs> when I was uh, at the high school uh, period. Yes, high school. And uh, yes, yeah, uh, the high school. I, I grew up uh, in a family, in the hospitality, basically. Okay. My family always had a bar and cafes. And so not, not, not a wine background, but uh, that kind of field. Mm -hmm. So I don't know my passion for wine where you know, from which, from where it came uh, from, but uh, I grew up uh, in my teenager age with this uh, passion. Uh, so uh, my studies are not in the enological uh, school, but are mm -hmm. languages. Uh, when I met uh, Luca Currado Vietti, which uh, was uh, uh, part of the family, it was the, the, the family family winery, uh, I started to <laughs> the, to hang out with him, and we we grew up together. So uh, when you will ask me who is your inspiration for me, it was then uh, my actual husband, <laughs> still so uh, romantic, so, romantic. so Italian, <laughs> yeah, because uh, I was young, he was young. We were both young, and uh, you know, we are uh, after more than 30 years, we are still uh, uh, trying to, <laughs> uh, to go further. Uh, so, actually, uh, my, first, uh, my first job was not in the wine world, it was uh, in the hospitality, and then okay. immediately after, for a couple of years, in uh, a fashion company, so totally different field, and then uh, I jumped in the family winery. Uh, starting to, to work very closely to, with my husband, uh, always uh, supporting him, uh, of course, uh, in the decision in the cellar in terms of uh, uh, blending for the wine or decision, uh, uh, technical decision, let's say. But my... my, uh, my and what my year did you, you jump into the family business? Uh, but actually... 100% hundred percent full time mm -hmm. was uh, 2014, 15, okay. no more. Less. But uh, for me, it was uh, since uh, 94 when I married Luca. <laughs> I married Luca was uh, in 94, 94. So for me, it was, uh, yeah, that was uh, my, my family business too, so because yes. it was, uh, was a family affair. <laughs> and so, but, but I did uh, my job and that job. And then, uh, 100% at certain point I started to to be really completely involved with him in the in the cellar and still today we are uh, we are together and we try to do our best to uh, <laughs> to keep going uh, let's say uh, the, we are yeah continue I'm sorry. sorry no 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 please please well the Vietti vineyard is 100% family owned no it was 100% family owned and okay. then in 2016 uh, there are uh, an American company mm -hmm. uh, entered into Vietti. So we, my husband and I, we are uh, we continue to run uh, the winery. But uh, right now the ownership is uh, an American ownership, a US. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, but uh, both of us are still uh, there. Uh, Luca for the, and, the yeah, winemaking. The, Luca, Luca for, you know, is the winemaker, is uh, the one uh, involved in the, in the production. For me, is uh, the help in the technical decision, but mainly for uh, the sales, the commercial part, uh, and also part of the welcoming, uh, of course, the seller, because we have uh, a lot of visitors, but of course, we have also a lot of help. The team at the 8 is very extremely very important without the team yes. uh, i mean uh, it's very difficult to to do things you have to <laughs> to to build up uh, your own uh, team uh, to help you every day and that's so that's exactly thanks, what uh, this is uh, le mire said so i have a exactly. new phrase for us women and now the new phrase is behind every great woman there's a team yeah of that's course you should that, say now that, that, yeah, that's that's behind me. every great woman there's a big team <laughs> no that, that that's for sure but i think uh would be impossible without an help so you have to admit yes. uh, that you need the help mm -hmm. uh, and it's up to you how you build up this uh, relationship with your team mm -hmm. uh, your team needs to be part of a family and if uh, the team uh, feels that to be part of uh, this beautiful family as in this case, uh, our winery. I think uh, also the, the, 
uh, for them the job to you know to arrive to the highest quality to arrive to certain goals becomes uh, easier so it's up to us uh, really to create uh, a, a great uh, team to support uh, in an everyday uh, uh, kind of uh, job which are a lot in a winery That's starting from the field <laughs> till the sales part so there are many 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 aspects it's, it's not, not only one aspect yeah mm -hmm. Uh, just to say, we're going to start with the, our next wine. Alors, uh, maintenant, on va passer à la deuxième dégustation, qui est le Vietti La Crena Barbara Dasti 2019. Alors, vous pouvez vous servir ce verre de vin. Uh, uh, Barbara is one of uh, our, a lot of our wine to Vietti, because Vietti is, is an historical winery. Yes. <clears throat> dated back 1873 so let's say that uh, uh, some years ago in Piemonte so we are north uh, west part of Italy uh, where uh, one of the most important varietal is for sure the Nebbiolo which gives the Barolo and the Barbaresco but is land since the 1800s to Barbera so Barbera is really one of uh, the most uh, I would say important varietal, autochthon varietal of, uh, of the area. Uh, and we are very close to Barbera. At Yeti, we have uh, five different labels to give an idea. Uh, and this evening, we are tasting one of the five. This is the Barbera Dusty Lacrena. Uh, 18 is the vintage. Lacrena is the name of the vineyard, so it's a single vineyard, it's a crew. Uh, it's in the village of Valiano, which is one of the three villages where the high-quality Barbera Dassi is produced. Yes. And the particularity of this Barbera is that, for me, is that it uh, was planted part in 32 and part in 35. So we are talking about uh, a, a Barbera with very old vines. Wow. <laughs> and it uh, gives uh, really an uh, extraordinary uh, character <laughs> to, to wow. the wine. Uh, this is not a simple Barbera, this is something very pretty unique. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's complex. Uh, complex Beautiful. complexity. Beautiful. Oh, yes. the, the, the nose uh, is very deep, uh, it's very profound. Uh, the color. I mean, mm -hmm. I hope you can see, is a very deep uh, ruby color, mm -hmm. very rich. Uh, the age of the vines, so when, you know, older is a, is a vine, older is a vineyard, and uh, higher natural uh, uh, quality gives, you know, because we work in very low yield per hectare, but uh, in this case, in this vineyard, since it's very old, the production is very, very low. So the concentration goes... Uh, really in few grapes and uh, so aging uh, aged vineyards gives always uh, much more intensity yes. uh, to the wine also in the mouth echo what, what particularity of the barbera is the acidity mm -hmm. barbera is uh, a very high in acidity wine mm -hmm. uh, nebbiolo is the uh, tannins Barbera is acid, acidity. so acidity. And so that's why this is the wine that historically in the region has been always combined more than any other wines with food because the acidity helps, we say, to digest. Also to digest the kind of heavy, heavy kind of food. Yes. In this case, heavy meals. This barbera, yes. heavy meals. Uh, in this case, uh, Barbera, uh, this Barbera goes very well with, uh, you know, uh, steak. I, yes. lo I love to have, you know, big steak. Some, you know, braised meat, but in sauce. Uh, some good pasta with, uh, you know, nice sauce. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that Barbera is really uh, the most versatile uh, wine that we have in Piemonte. Versatile because it goes with really several different kind of food. It's uh, always the most uh, appreciated wine by the chef because when they have to create a dish, to go, when we do a lot of wine tasting, uh, mm -hmm. dinner, uh, wine dinner, etc., chef, they love Barbera because Barbera goes really with so many different kinds of uh, food. It's really versatile. Because it's very, uh, it's nicely structured. It's, it's rich, but not 
hard overly, to pair. It's not overly rich and it's beautifully exactly. easily to pair. And there so is always this, beautiful. yes. And the beauty and the pairing is the, due also to this the beautiful uh, acidity, acidity, of course. Yes, exactly. The acidity is really cleaning uh, the palate. And when and when, uh, especially with this Barrera, what I love is uh, the richness, the opulence, uh, the big shoulder, of course, yes. but the elegance. And the elegance is really because of the age of the vines. The age of the vines uh, gives uh, always this very beautiful uh, roundness uh, and uh, kind of more pleasant approach, even if you, you feel that it's a very structured and very, you know, big shoulder wow. wine. Remind me again the age of the, um, the vine? The, age, the oldest part was planted in 1932. Wow. And the youngest part in 1935. So <laughs> this is the, and the production yeah, here is uh, ve very limited. So we have 10,000 bottles every year around okay. for okay. this wine. So yes. uh, is the crew is a single vineyard. So when we talk about uh, crew as, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in uh, the French, uh, yes. uh, it's Lango. always, yes. uh, it's, it's really very limited uh, production quantities that's, so, very, that's yeah, amazing thank yeah, you very yeah. much elena thank you, you are very, very welcome much. now i have a, a next question for uh, everybody here j'ai une prochaine question pour vous mesdames alors uh, avec uh, votre expérience et les voyages que vous avez fait uh, partout dans le monde uh, et aussi uh, l'accès technologique qu'on a uh, maintenant en, en 2023 um, quel est pour vous um, le, le, le Qu'est-ce que vous, vous allez donner comme conseil à une jeune femme qui veut jouer un, mais plutôt qui veut travailler un rôle clé dans, dans l'industrie? So my question is, with all of the access that we have and traveling around the world, uh, and also um, the access that we have with internet, uh, what would you give as an advice to uh, a young woman that wants to work in this industry or what would you give as an advice to your younger self back in the days? Alors aussi, qu'est-ce que vous voulez donner comme, aussi comme, comme conseil à vous lorsque vous étiez plus jeune pour travailler dans cette industrie? Madame Le Maire. Non, moi, je dirais, excusez l'anglicisme, mais je dirais, no guts, no glory. Oh, euh, je pense qu'il y a beaucoup de, de plus en plus de place pour les femmes et je pense que les femmes doivent prendre leur place. Euh, je pense que les femmes doivent rester focus sur, euh, sur leur objectif, sans en fixer un. Un euh, plan A qui va se prendre au plan, rendre au plan Z, mais toujours dans la même, euh, dans le même, pour rencontrer le même objectif. Je pense qu'elles doivent suivre leur intuition, mais surtout se servir de leur habilité à faire travailler les gens ensemble euh, vers euh, un but commun. Euh, ce qui est le plus important est euh, de travailler dans la joie euh, et d'amener la bonne humeur, c'est ça que les gens cherchent dans le produit comme dans la, la maison qui les fait. C'est bien dit, merci beaucoup. Um, Elena, what would you say? Ben, I have a young daughter that oh. she... <laughs> That's she perfect loves, timing. Uh, <laughs> perfect timing, mm. she loves uh, this kind of world and uh, hopefully, I don't know in the future if she will join or not, but uh, for that, for me, yes, in this world that is running so fast with all this uh, technology, mm -hmm. Facebook uh, and then uh, uh, Instagram and then all this uh, kind of stuff, uh, which uh, sometimes, uh, you know, for us are, are nice and sometimes are too much. Yes. Uh, that's are important, yes. But I always say to my my daughter and I, what I, what I think is to be always uh, very humble respectful of uh, the land if you want to, to do this work and to work very early to, to have a, a much better world in terms of also of climate possibly mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. So to work more green, uh, to work more in this, uh, you know, uh, sustainability. So this mm -hmm. is something that uh, also for the younger generation and also for, for women, which have a lot of sensibility, I think is uh, something that, uh, that they should focus more, more and more. Uh, women, they have a lot of uh, capacity. 
but uh, still today they have to work harder and harder compared to male, on my opinion, I'm sorry. But uh, I hope that for the next generation, uh, who will be a little bit uh, different. Uh, and we try with our generation to, you know, to have opened a little bit uh, the, the way, let's say. Yes, our horizons, yeah. Yeah. And thank you very much. And for you, uh, Mrs. Putnam. Oh, well, it's an interesting comment that uh, Madame Lemaire uh, said, because I have used that expression, no gut glory, <laughs> myself many, many, many times. <laughs> People have heard me running through the wine, you're going, no guts, no glory. Yeah. You have to it's a very American expression. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that you use that. Um, I would say that, that, yes, we are held to a different standard. Mm -hmm. We need to work harder than our male counterparts. I think women are also better multitaskers. Mm -hmm. And I think we're also more empathetic. So I think we have a better ability to understand what the other people are going for. But the biggest advice that I would give people is to believe in yourself and that the only limitation that you really have is a limitation that you put on yourself. And like if your inner voice is saying, I can't do this, well, then you're not going to do it. It doesn't matter how many experiences that have been given to you. If your inner voice says, I can't do this, then it's not going to happen. But if you believe in yourself and you say that the world is my oyster and I can do anything, then that is 100% what is going to happen. Did I think when I started that I would end up being, you know, uh, fortunate enough to be vice president of winemaking? No. I didn't expect that when I started. However, I never said that I couldn't do it. I always said, I can do this. And you just have to push yourself harder than anyone else would push you. And there are no limits. That's so well said. Wow. Moi, j'ajouterais qu'il oui. faut pas, euh, si je peux me permettre, oui. il faut euh, vraiment pas avoir peur de se montrer aussi. Mm -hmm. je... Euh, mm -hmm. Je pense que des, des vidéos, votre, votre, euh, cette initiative-ci, mm -hmm. ça peut donner l'exemple à des femmes dans le monde du vin. Je pense qu'il faut de plus en plus les mettre de l'avant et se mettre de l'avant puis pas avoir peur de ça. C'est vraiment très important parce que c'est comme ça que les autres vont avoir des, des modèles. Oui. Alors, il faut, il faut être vu publiquement aussi. Puis enlever le syndrome de l'imposteur. C'est ça. Ça, c'est la pire voilà. chose. Oui. oui. Ça s'en vient, ça, ça. On est de plus en plus nombreuses. Oui. C'est vrai, c'est très vrai. Merci. Thank you very much. Next question, prochaine question. C'est une belle transition qu'on va avoir. Quelle est votre personne d'inspiration dans n'importe quelle sphère de votre vie? Who is, this is a great uh, segue, who is the person that inspired you in any aspect in your life? Madame le maire. Écoutez, moi, j'en je, oh. nommerais trois, si vous me permettez. Bien sûr. La première, c'est ma mère euh, qui venait, comme je vous l'ai dit au début, de, mm -hmm. de la culture maraîchère. Et elle, ce qu'elle m'a montré, c'est vraiment... Euh, on n'avait pas beaucoup d'argent chez nous, donc elle faisait tout. Hein. Elle faisait son vin, elle faisait nos vêtements, elle faisait la nourriture, elle faisait tout, euh, vraiment. Alors, elle m'a montré l'appréciation pour le travail artisan. Alors, le, les choses faites à la main, avec soin, avec temps. Euh, la deuxième personne, je vous dirais... Euh, que je n'ai pas connu, mais c'était la veuve Clicquot. J'ai beaucoup lu sur ce qu'elle a accompli. Puis vraiment, vraiment, ça a été un vrai modèle pour moi parce qu'elle, elle était vraiment comme ça. No guts, no glory. Mm -hmm. Puis la troisième personne, c'est Jancis Robinson, qui, comme je vous l'ai dit au début, elle nous a donné vraiment un bon coup de pouce. Mais ce que j'aime surtout en elle, c'est son ouverture. C'est vraiment quelqu'un qui, qui est ouverte. Qui sait qu'elle en a bu des grands crus, elle a bu toutes sortes de vins, elle. Mais même maintenant, après toutes ces années, elle est ouverte à la découverte, elle est mm -hmm. ouverte aux nouvelles choses. Et puis, euh, euh, c'est vraiment quelqu'un dont l'ouverture me, me surprend et qui est un modèle à ce niveau-là euh, pour nous. Elle vraiment. est vraiment euh, quelqu'un. Je la lis encore euh, régulièrement dans le Financial Times. Puis pour quelqu'un comme elle, c'est quand même spectaculaire de voir euh, qu'elle est aussi humble, tu sais, parce oui. qu'elle a quand même tout vu. Ah, ben, Jensis, Robinson, si j'avais un mot à, à dire qui la caractérise, c'est ça, c'est l'humilité. 
L'humilité devant voilà. le produit et devant le travail voilà. et devant les artisans, vraiment. Vraiment. Et puis vraiment. ça, euh, comme on l'a dit précédemment, il faut être humble pour faire du vin parce qu'on ne mm -hmm. dirige pas tout. Mm -hmm. Mère nature est notre patronne. Et puis, et ouais. <rire> on la, ne on la contrôle pas. <rire> Mère nature est notre patronne, c'est bien dit. Et pour vous, uh, Elena, who is your uh, person, it could be more than one person, your inspiration? Uh, I have... Uh... Three as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> that are uh, all family. Oh, that's <laughs> great. But my, my mother, of course, because even if she didn't allow me to, to do the neurological school, uh, I have a, a great admiration for her because uh, she's one of the strongest women uh, I ever met. Uh, she, she lost my father when she was very young. We, I was very young. So she, she, she really teach me a lot and how to really, uh, um, say, how to uh, pass on a very difficult moment mm -hmm. and to be, you know, strong enough uh, uh, to stand up on a certain uh, uh, situation. And uh, first of all, uh, to to believe in myself <laughs> and in what I was, uh, I wanted then at the end to do because she knew that my passion was that uh, and I was very, very determined. Uh, my father, that unfortunately I lost when I was uh, very young and uh, uh, for, for him I was a little baby always, but uh, echo, he, he always told me the same. You have to believe in yourself, you have to believe in your dreams, and you you need to fight for what uh, you want to be and what you would like to be. Uh, and the third one uh, is a man again, is my husband, because, uh, of course, I met him when I was uh, 18 uh, and with this big passion. Uh, and uh, he really helped me a lot uh, to grow, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, in this way, in this field. He teach me a lot. He teach, he teach me, of course, uh, Every day we teach each other <laughs> at this beautiful. point after mm -hmm. after 30 years. But yes, is uh, in this world, especially in the wine world, uh, he has been my greatest uh, inspiration. Thank you very much. And You're Mrs., very welcome, uh, Mrs. Putnam. Well, I think I'm going to have multiple inspiration as well because oh, I think right. that you take inspiration from different people mm -hmm. in different times of your life, and uh, it is to sound very boring because everyone else has said this Stop. but i will well i will say my parents um mm -hmm. for different reasons both of my parents grew up very 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 poor and you know my my mom quit college uh, when she was pregnant with me my my father had to work two jobs to put himself through college so they taught me that it doesn't matter what your circumstance is it's what you make of that circumstance and so they grew up from very poor um background but they were able to make something of themselves and then pass that on to me and uh unfortunately i lost i too lost my father at a very young age mm -hmm. and from that my mom taught me that you can't always rely on men <laughs> no. so yeah. you need to rely on yourself because maybe they'll be there maybe they won't but at the end of the day, the person that you need to rely on, that isn't an outside person. It's an inside person. It comes from you. Um, the next inspiration would actually be my first boss because he was the one who, although it took a little convincing, I had to write a list for him of all the things that I could do so that he could really believe in me and promote me. Wow. Um, but it, it's just, you know, it's, it's, when someone believes in you, you want to work for them. And so that's mm -hmm. very inspiring. And I, I would be remiss to not also say that the women who came before me were also inspirations. Yeah. And specifically, uh, um, uh, actually one that I'm good friends with and I go scuba diving with, uh, Heidi Barrett and also uh, Celia Welsh. Those were very famous uh, women consulting winemaker that mm -hmm. came before me. But what they what they taught me is that um, you can be a very savvy businesswoman because these are both women who own their own companies, mm -hmm. have their own wine labels and are very successful, but are also very nice mm -hmm. and very humble and very sweet. And they're not what you would expect. They're not the 
the mean managers that sometimes I think some women can get cast as. So they taught, you know, they showed me that you can be who you are to be, you know, big, strong, beefy man to get what you want. They're very successful winemakers and successful businesswomen. Thank you. I think like the word of the day in this industry is to be humble. I mm -hmm. think because back in the days, I've been in the wine industry for 20 years now, and I'm seeing this more and more that it's becoming more and more humble and people are more reaching out and becoming more human. So I'm just, just talking to all of you is, it's really humbling. Well, don't yeah. you think that's because women are more and more totally. present? Totally. You know? Totally. Yeah. I think we the had a big influence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. It's so beautiful. Merci beaucoup yeah. pour vos, uh, <laughs> vos réponses. Alors, uh, maintenant, on va aller se rejoindre en, en Californie mm. avec uh, Madame Putnam de chez Raymond Vineyard. Thank you so much to be here with us uh, today. And we're going to segue to California. And can you please tell us what sparked your passion for wines? Well, it's, it's a, somewhat of a funny story. I, I was very fortunate and that I grew up with wine. My parents, you know, I, I said were very poor mm -hmm. when they grew up. And so they bought all of their own china and silverware. So for me, when I was a child, food and wine was part of my life. And that that is not typical for an American at that time. Very typical for Europeans, but not typical for Americans. Okay. I grew up eating multi-course meals because my parents loved that. They're like, we bought this china, we bought this uh, crystal, we're going to use it. That's amazing. <laughs> Which part of the States were you, you grew up? Oh, uh, I grew up in San Francisco. Okay. So very close to uh, Northern California, Napa Valley. Yes. So I always had this food and wine background. In fact, my parents would let me drink wine. And more importantly, I had my own crystal decanter as a, as a child. And... <laughs> No, it, it, it gets cuter. Um, so we would actually color coordinate my grape juice to whatever wine. They, if they were drinking white wine, I would have white Concord grape juice. If they were drinking red wine, I could have it or I would drink, you know, standard grape juice. If they were drinking an older wine, I would put my grape juice or whatever I was drinking in a decanter as well so I could be like them. So I had that in my background but i actually when i went to uc davis i didn't start off as a wanting to be an enology major i wanted to start off as a poli sci political science major because i i wanted to be an fbi agent uh, i wanted to be what i know <laughs> what <laughs> from wine to fbi agent I, i've always i need a glass of water <laughs> I think okay. it's a glass of wine. Um, I've always been very specific <laughs> in, in what I wanted. And I wanted to be an FBI agent, which is, you know, a, a government agent, mm -hmm. in essence. And uh, unfortunately, at the time, they had a height requirement. Oh. And so uh, you can't tell, but I'm actually quite short. Okay. I'm five foot. Oh. On a on a like a big hair day. On a good maybe, hair day. Maybe maybe actually I'm not even five foot. Okay. Um, on a big hair day I might be five foot, but okay. normally I'm four eleven, four feet eleven inches, so I'm quite short. Um, <laughs> on a good so, on a good San Francisco wind. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the hair product. I learned that at a young age. <laughs> okay. Um, but going to school and realizing I I, I reached I've. I did some research and I was verbally told and then also read it myself that you had to be 5'2 at that time to be a, uh, an FBI agent. Yeah, okay. So clearly, when you're 18, I am not going to get any taller. In fact, I'm actually getting shorter as all of us are. <laughs> I went to see a, a doctor and the nurse was measuring my height and she said, no, no, you're 4'11 and a half. I'm like, no, no. I'm 4'11 and three quarters. And she's like, no, you're 4'11 and a half. I'm like, have you not worked in the service industry? Just say I'm 4'11 and three quarters and write down that I'm 4'11 and a half. <laughs> Just make me happy. Um, so clearly I'm not going to be 5'2". So I took a class actually in enology at Davis okay. and I thought, this is amazing. I get to drink every day. Who doesn't want to do that? <laughs> so I, I took, I, 
I took the class at Davis and I instantly changed my major to enology and I've never looked back because I love every year is different and that's what keeps it so interesting and engaging and it's you against mother nature and what is she going to give you and and so I love that aspect of being creative and working with mother nature so I do have some friends in the FBI and I always tell them that they ever need anyone I'm happy to to help them out no way I'm guilty but that's good friends to have though that's good friends to have and you're a good friend to them so that's good yes. That's yes. good. That's a good exchange. Yeah. <laughs> they protect you and you cool them down. That's all. That's great. It's a great exchange. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, one of the uh, guys that I know actually started a, a wine blog, actually. Really? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, 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 <laughs> so we went out to lunch one time and we're like, I want to be you. And he says, I want to be you. <laughs> exactly. That is so funny. That's funny. Um, so yeah, so I went to Davis, got my uh, degree in enology, mm -hmm. and felt that if I wanted to be taken seriously, I needed to work from the ground up. So I started working in the cellar for uh, over a year, dragging hoses with all the guys, and they played all their dirty tricks on me. And then I was the company was growing, and so I was able to become enologist or you know a lab person, and then assistant winemaker and then winemaker, and then. I moved on to another job, uh, uh, another winery as winemaker, and then I've been at Raymond Vineyards for uh, over 13 years now. Wow. Yeah. And now talking about Raymond Vineyard, can you give us a little bit of the history of the vineyard? So Raymond Vineyards was founded in 1974 okay. by the Raymond family, and but they can actually trace their their winemaking legacy back to the late 1800s with the Beringer family. Roy Raymond Sr., the mm -hmm. founder of the winery, married Martha Jane Beringer, the granddaughter of, of founder of Beringer Vineyards. And when Beringer Vineyards sold in the early 70s, um, the Raymonds, who had been working at uh, Beringer Vineyards for many years, decided they wanted to take their portion of the money and create a winery in their own name. So they uh, bought bought the land that the winery is on today. Mm -hmm. We are located in the heart of Napa Valley, just south of the town of St. Helena in 1971. And the first crop, the first year of production was 1974. And uh, the family ran it for many years until a very quiet, very shy Frenchman by the name of Jean-Charles Boisset came and convinced them that uh, they needed to sell the winery to him because no one was going to appreciate and honor their legacy more than he would. And so um, the winery has been part of the Boisset family since 2009. Okay. And I started very shortly after that. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And now, mesdames et messieurs, on va maintenant débuter la dégustation avec le réserve de, du uh, Raymond Vineyards 2019. Before the tasting, can you please explain the room that you're in? Because it matches well, with the bottle. Well, that is by design. This is actually a red velvet label. Yes, and the yes. um, the label was inspired by the room. So this is our very famous red room where it is inspired by all of the tastes and the smells and the color of red wine. So this, this is a place where guests can come um, to the winery and taste some of our older vintage or some of our higher end wines. Um, in a very secluded, very uh, VIP, luxury, Moulin Rouge kind of vibe. Okay. A kind of a so private experience. Fun. Yes. And actually, the winery, the, the Napa Valley Reserve Cabernet, which is the wine that we have mm -hmm. with the red velvet label, that red velvet label was created for our 40th anniversary. Okay. And we wanted a, a label that would represent the red room and uh i believe red is the color of of um the 40th anniversary the room i i think um so this label is a nod to our past which is years and then also to the present and the future which is the red room and the, the wine it's not that a wine actually mimics 
the wine label, mm -hmm. but we try and give the wine, create the wine that has a lot of texture and a lot of velvety, velvet, velvetiness, much like the label. And if a client wants to go to that room, they have to reserve. Yes, they do. It helps to reserve, mm -hmm. um, but depending on the time of year, during the summer and in the fall, I would say it helps to reserve a tasting experience. Um, you just go on the winery's website. Um, but if it during the early spring, you can certainly walk in and do a tasting in a red room. Yes, we have lots of fun experiences at the winery for people to partake in. That's great. So let's begin the tasting. Yes. Can you guide us through, please? Of course. So this is our uh, 2019 Napa Valley Reserve Cabernet. Mm -hmm. And this is the, I would say the Napa Valley Reserve Cab is a wine that most people know us for. It's the one that most people recognize out in the marketplace. Certainly the red velvet label <laughs> is, is one that is very uh, uh, popular. In fact, when I was telling the story of the label, I was saying that for our 40th uh, anniversary and we meant to only produce it one year and go back to our old white label. Mm -hmm. And it was so popular that everyone begged us to keep the label. And so we've decided to keep the label. Um, but this Cabernet is a wine that is a mix of estate and purchased fruit and about 40% of the grapes come from our estate here in, um, Rutherford and San Lina. So we're in, more in the, uh, the center part of Napa Valley mm -hmm. and our estate fruit are grown organically and biodynamic. We are certified with, uh, CCOF, California Certified Organic Farmers, and also Demeter for our biodynamic practices. For both. Great. Wow. Okay. Both. So about 40% of the wine comes from our estate in St. Lena and Rutherford. And the balance of the fruit comes from about 10 other growers uh, within Napa Valley. So it goes all the way up to Calistoga, where you get a little bit with a warmer climate. So you get a little bit more of that high tone kind of purple fruit. Um, and then all the way down to the cooler parts of Napa, where there's Coombsville, where you get more of that textural component, a little bit more of the savory aspect to it. This wine, uh, I treat it much, I wouldn't say it's very, in some ways it's very French in style. So one of my big beliefs in winemaking is uh, I love extended maceration because I think that as a winemaking technique, it makes the wine complete. Yeah. It helps build the middle palate and increase the length of the wine. So that's something that I really do a lot of on this wine. Mm -hmm. the, average time on skins is actually about 49 days Oof. so it, it takes a long time wow. on the skins but i think that's what makes it a balanced wine that exactly. seems okay. quality wow. in terms of aromatics i think this is a wine that that is very compelling it keeps drawing you in because as as the wine sits in the glass it evolves when i first smelled it about an hour ago it was very much driven by a dark chocolate, like a 70% dark chocolate. And then it had a little bit of a of an anise character. And now I'm getting more of a violet, very perfumey aromatics. And there's a little bit of a red currant, but there's that really also that real purity of fruit that yes, you can- But I that love the chocolate. Smell. I keep on smelling the chocolate. It's so yeah, that, yummy, that, yes. That, yeah, it's, a dark, it's a dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a, it's a very compelling wine. It's a very seductive wine because it keeps, you're like, hmm, that was a dark chocolate. And it matches with the label. Oh, yes. It's so beautiful. Yes. <laughs> it's totally beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we have to do something to live up to the label because I imagine. The, the, label will sell, the label will sell the first bottle, but people will come back and buy it again yeah. because of the yeah. quality in the bottle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I really think that you see some of the pride that the entire team takes uh, in the wine when you taste it. There's a lot of texture to it. It's a very silky wine. There's a lot of elegance to it. But there's also a, a sweetness to the tannins that I think is in the core from the start to the finish that I think is really the signature of the wine. And how long did it take for you to, well, for the, the team to get the two certifications? Because that's a lot of work. 
it is a lot of work. The um, organic and the biodynamic. You can, you can do both certifications simultaneously. So you can get organic takes three years. Okay. And Demeter takes two years. And then you do an annual certification. And then we do our, we just finished our annual certification. So our vineyards are certified and our winery is certified. We don't bottle this as a made with organic. Okay. Because some of the uh, great, we purchase grapes. And a lot of the grapes that we purchase, people will farm sustainably or organic, but they don't necessarily go through the certification process. Got it. So, so every single year you have to go through it. Every year the, the inspectors come out and make sure that you're following all the guidelines and you're not using anything that is not an, an approved chemical. Um, you have to print out your records. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's an arduous task. But it, I think it's it, if you love wine and you love the land, then I think it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. for not my generation. The generation to come. Maybe not even the next generation, but it's for the grandchildren. Yes. We yes. need to protect the land and by farming it in a way that is sustainable and helps put back more things than we take i think getting certified as organic or biodynamic is the right choice wow, thank you very much and thank you for this great tasting and thank you to everyone here alors nous voici maintenant à la fin de cet superbe événement aux participants merci d'être là avec nous et à vous, euh, les mesdames, merci de partager votre temps, votre expérience et surtout votre passion des vins. Ce fut un honneur de participer à cette dégustation et merci au nom de la SAQ et de moi-même. Et à vous à la maison, encore une fois, merci pour euh, votre temps et de participer à cette dégustation. Et je vous laisse maintenant la scène et le micro à vous, mesdames. Madame Lemire, un petit... Euh, J'aimerais d'abord remercier la SAQ parce que vraiment, c'est important, comme je disais tantôt, de faire briller les femmes, les producteurs, les vignerons, vigneronnes. Alors, merci beaucoup. Et puis, j'inviterai euh, tous les Québécois et ceux qui nous regardent d'ailleurs à venir faire un tour euh, à notre vignoble. Il y a vraiment beaucoup de choses à déguster. On a aussi beaucoup de vins à la SAQ que je vous invite à déguster. Partez à l'aventure. Vous savez, il y a tellement de cépages variés dans le monde que ça vaut la peine. Le monde du vin, c'est avant, avant tout un monde d'expérience et d'aventure. Alors, je souhaite à tout le monde les plus belles expériences cette année. Merci. Elena, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation and to be part of this beautiful conversation. Uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed the tasting and I hope to really welcome you uh, in Piemonte, in Castiglione Falletto at the winery. Uh, not only to visit the winery and taste the wine, but really to enjoy the beautiful uh, landscape, uh, region uh, where we live uh, and amazing food uh, that, uh, uh, that we have. So looking forward to to see you in Piemonte. Grazie mille. Thank you so much. <laughs> and to you, Mrs. Putnam. Uh, well, thank you. I, I think it's always a great thing to, even though the connection is, is viral, I think it's great to meet other strong women in across the world. I think it's always an inspiration to meet and talk with women who have gone through similar experiences. And, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity that the SAQ has given us. And I would love for uh, anyone to come visit us in Napa Valley. And we'd love to see as many people as possible. And to thank you again for the invitation to be part of this group. À vous, à la maison, à notre prochaine dégustation. Chin chin. Chin chin.